We're in our series entitled Masks. I think it's appropriate. I think God is shifting things around. I think he's trying to get his church in a posture where they'll just be real with him. When we talk about uh, taking the mask off, we're not talking about you going around and telling everybody in the world how dysfunctional you are. We already know that. Because we all have an element of dysfunction within us. And you know that. And so last week we, we launched this series. We began to talk about we wear masks and, and we hide from God because Adam and Eve hid from God because of their shame. Many people today are afraid to come to church, afraid to go to a life group, afraid to engage in a Bible study, or afraid to even read the Word themselves because of what they have done in their past. And they begin to hide from God. And so we discovered that there are three things that cause us to wear masks. And one of those things is that we have had some painful, sinful experience. And sometimes we can get over the experience, but the shame tries to linger and it marks us deeply. And the second thing is this, we identify what we did and we take what we did and we make that our identity, even though Jesus forgives us and says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, we tend to carry that with us, which keeps us from becoming everything that God has destined for us. And then the third thing is we have that experience that we've had or something's happened in our life. And so we believe that the only way to be safe is to just hide. And so we hide from people and we put on a good face and we come to church and we tell people, you know, in response to their question, how are you? Well, I'm blessed and, and wonderfully made and gloriously made when in reality we're struggling. And a good confession is, is wonderful, but who do you have in your life that knows the good, the bad, and the ugly in your life and can challenge you to stretch beyond where you are? We went into that scripture where Jesus taught you don't take new wine and put it in an old wineskin because if you do, it will tear and the new wine will burst out and fall on the floor. And so new wine is what God is up to today. And I speak with enough leaders every week that call and text and message that there is an incredible burden upon ministers today because they don't know what God's doing. And so we are shifted and moved by everything we see on Facebook. And I would tell you that if you're in a love affair with Facebook, you might want to reconsider dating that. Because there's so many things out there. And we need to get back to the truth and the validity and the stability of the Word of God because that's what will carry us through uncertain times. Let me just for reference only remind you, and you can make a note and you can read this scripture later, in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, there's a story of Jesus going into the synagogue. In other words, he went to church that day. The Bible says there was a man with a withered hand, and the Pharisees, the religious people, began to look at Jesus to see whether or not he would heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus was a controversial figure. He loved to upset and demolish everything that the religious people had established in regulations and rules. And so he told the man with the withered hand, I don't know if Jesus had the platform, I don't know if he had the opportunity to read from the scriptures that day, but evidently he had the podium, the spotlight was upon him. He saw the man with the withered hand. We don't know much about this man other than he was physically impaired. And he told the man with the withered hand, stand up. About that moment, the religious folks were just vehement. They were angry. Because on the Sabbath was not an appropriate time to heal. And I begin to hear from religious people all across the United States and around the world that as we begin to stretch and do things different, that this isn't appropriate, that's not appropriate. But if it's all birthed in a desire to reach the lost and build the kingdom even if it violates your religious regulations. So Jesus looks at him. Jesus did not spit on his arm. He did not give him an anointed cloth. He did not come and lay hands on him. But he gave him an instruction. And he said to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand. And the man was obedient Here's the key. You want a miracle from God? How about obeying the word? 
And the man stretched forth his arm and immediately was made whole. Is it possible in this season that we're living in that our willingness to be stretched contains the miracle that we've been praying for? We don't like to be stretched. We don't like to be taken beyond what we feel comfortable with. But we are all uncomfortable. Now, I received warning today from my staff to stop doing what I love to do. Because I like to interact with you and I like to fist bump you. So here's my remedy. I'm going to carry a can of Lysol. The next time I fist bump you, I'm going to spray you down. That way I get the best of all things. I can get close to you. Because I'm trying to navigate a situation in our culture that's very difficult. I'm getting bombasted and bombarded by Christian people, not the world. Why are you doing this? Why don't you do this? And so my challenge, I can deal with the devil. In fact, the devil is easier to deal with than church folk. Because I don't have an answer that will satisfy some church folk. So we need to just stretch a little bit and give one another some leeway so that we can accomplish what we need to do. God is still doing miracles. I've had men and women in my office this week. I had a young lady in my office this week that was trembling, and we helped her this week financially with her electric bill. Here's what she told me, and I didn't have to ask. I need God, but I don't know how to get a hold of him. There are many people that need God, but they don't have the information that will give them the pathway to connect with him. And so they're wandering around in the earth, and they see what's happening, and they're willing to take the mask off and be vulnerable and say, I just need God. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I need to do. I don't know how to do this. There was a trauma in her life, and the trauma is attempting to identify who she is. The trauma is attempting to keep her depressed. But when Jesus is Lord of your life, and you have somebody that can speak into your life, you can be vulnerable and take the mask off that is deceiving you. Let me take you to James chapter 1 and verse 22. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. You need to be a doer of the word. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. The King James says this, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. John chapter 8 and verse 32 says this, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You might say, well, what is truth? His word is truth. Jesus prayed in the garden and said, Lord, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Can I just draw a line in the sand today? Muhammad is not truth. Confucius is not truth. Mormonism is not truth. Jehovah Witness is not truth. The Word of God is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as we stand for him, God is going to help us. I want you to watch this. Hi, my name's Jean Titus, and I'm 66 years old, and I've come to New Life for over 30 years, and uh, I... Love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and have a story to tell, just like everybody else has a story to tell. I was raised uh, in United Pentecostal Church. My dad was a Pentecostal preacher. My grandfather was a minister of the gospel. I have a couple uncles that are ministers of the gospel. So it was a pretty much given that I would be raised in that setting. I remember sitting on the curb of a sidewalk with another little girl around 10 years old. And somehow we started talking about religion. And I, in my mind, I can't remember if I spoke the words out to her, but in my mind, the way I was taught that she was gonna go to hell unless she believed in United Pentecostal religion. And that was one way and the only way. I was raised in a church, uh, very legalistic. 
a lot of you can't do this, you can't do that. So during my growing up years, I had a love for Christ, but especially in my teenage years, uh, there was some rebellion because I wanted to have fun. And it seemed that everything that was fun was wrong. I grew into a relationship with a, a man that was a very quick relationship before marriage, believing that I needed to get married or um, you know Christ was going to come back and I would miss out on having a family and doing the things that were fun in life. So I made hasty decisions, but because of that relationship I have two beautiful children from that relationship. And then a course of time, I slipped away from God and um, made some poor choices and had an, another relationship that failed and all because I wasn't putting God first. And then I got involved with New Life Tabernacle years ago and came and got involved and Instead of being religious, I had a relationship at that point with God instead of uh, religion. The breaking point from the religion to living worldly just felt so um, burdened down by uh, life. Uh, couldn't do this and couldn't do that. It was just, it was not a happy place for me. I felt like there wasn't any fun in life, and I wanted to experience. And Satan would try to tell me in my mind, well, you know, this is fun, and you need to experience this. And if you'll just do it for a little while, you know, then you can experience it and say you have and, and go on. And for a long time, I struggled with that. My mom at one point, bless her heart, she would, she would bug me. She would say, Jean Ann, did you go to church this weekend? Or are you gonna go to the church this weekend? And I'd say, finally I said, Mom, just leave me alone, please. If you wanna do anything, just pray for me. Well, duh, that, that was all that God needed for me to say and for her to, you know, just to get on her knees and quietly bring it before Him. And it wasn't long that I came back to Christ. And then I saw the need for my children to be in church. So I started going to Bethel Bible in Decatur and would take my children with me. And God just started doing a work in me. I remember one service, I was sitting about midway back. And I remember my chest just wasn't visibly seen, but inside it was just pounding like a freight train was going through it. And the Holy Spirit was just dealing with me and I just couldn't get down to the altar fast enough. And I felt, I felt a hand on my back, and it was Jack Greenwood, and he was praying for me at that time. He didn't know who I was. I appreciate people like that, that didn't judge me, and cared enough to step out and say, this girl needs some prayer. So I'm thankful for that. When I was uh, growing up in the faith that I was raised in, um, you know, you had to look a certain part. You had to look a certain way, um, especially being a pastor's daughter. There's a lot of pressure on you for that. The pressures of all those restrictions and the legalistic part of it was just bringing me down. But then when I began to understand a relationship with Christ as I got older and experienced those things and thought, hey, this world has nothing to offer me, just heartache after heartache. And then when I decided to commit my life back in 1987, and um, wasn't too long after that, maybe a year or two, I met my wonderful husband now. And we've been married 30 plus years and had another child together. And we have seven collectively children and 17th grandchild on the way. And uh, I just love life just living the dream and enjoying each other, enjoying new life, and it just couldn't be any better. Wow. You know, it's not just one particular denomination, but I think there 
are a lot of religious things that happen in many denominations, and they create an atmosphere where people have no choice but to wear a mask and to adhere to rules that are set that are not in the heart. And if the heart is not changed, nothing is changed. I remember one Sunday night, Jean Ann came to the altar and she looked at me and she said, if I don't find God here, I'm done. I'm done with my search. The power of God hit her that night. I believe the power of God wants to do something in our life. But people are seeking and searching for truth. If there is somebody in your life that loves you and approaches you and gently says there is something you need to change, listen to them. Don't stiff arm them. To all the young ladies that are looking for a young man, if your friends, your cousins, your relationships in life, if the lady at IGA tells you the guy you're seeing is a jerk. And you all know, you know, he's had three affairs on me and he never calls me, he never looks out for me. Don't stiff arm them. People that love you, that confront you and say there may be something wrong in your life, that's how the kingdom is supposed to work. Maybe you're looking in the mirror today and you're 5'10", 101 pounds, and you keep saying, I'm fat, fat, fat. No, you're not. You need somebody to help you navigate the trauma in your life instead of wearing a mask of deceit that leads to destruction. I believe that God is allowing pressure in our life and we need friendships in our life that will look us in the face and say, listen, your anger is not healthy. Your explosive anger is going to hurt other people and has hurt people and you're hurting yourself. And by the way, if somebody approaches you and goes, you are just overspending, your closets are full, your kids' closets look like Toys R Us. And we tell them to mind our own business, and yet we want people involved in our life, but will you let them in to help you remove masks that we create because of painful situations, because of shame? The Bible is very clear. If we're not doers of the word and we're only hearers, we are fooling ourselves. We are deceiving ourselves, and we put our ministry, our value, our gifting, our ability to influence other people we restrict it and we put it on hold. Thank God for people in our life that are willing to be truthful with us. Even when we don't want to hear it, we know it's going to help us and liberate us. That's why Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm not talking about people that constantly critique everything in life that you do. I'm talking about people that love you that say, listen, this issue in your life is going to do damage in your relationships, is going to do damage in other arenas of your life. If there are problems that you're struggling with, maybe you've got a teenager that has a little bit of rebellion. I don't know a parent in this house that has not had a teenager that's had some element of rebellion. How we deal with it. I heard a comedian last night say, my son is 30 some years old, he's living in my home. I've, he's become one of these Millennials that believes that the world owes him everything. And then this individual said, you know what? I've done everything in my power to help him. I've bought him cars. I've helped him out of jams. I've tried to run interference in every facet of his life. And then it dawned on this mom. I created this monster. And so... We need to learn to give proper direction and instruction because if we don't raise our kids, our school system will and the world will. In fact, it's already happening. I'm wondering if we could rise up and say, listen, at the risk of you not liking me, son, I'm not your friend, I'm your dad. And I'm going to give you this long adage, someday you'll thank me. It may be years from now, 
but someday you'll be glad that I set parameters in your life and helped you be real. What is God trying to show you or what is someone else as God's hand is upon them trying to help you with? I wonder if it's time for us just to be honest with somebody in our life and allow them to speak into our life and say, this is an area in your life that needs clarity, but we're so self-absorbed in our nation today that we've got a love affair with our cell phone Facebook And we don't want anyone to say anything derogatory or negative because I'm a person of faith. Yeah, but you're deceiving yourself. See, the word deceive means to beguile. It means to delude. It literally means to believe an untruth. It can mean to cheat. It can mean to mislead or to wash away. When we have the truth given to us, and we know it's the truth, are we willing to embrace it, or do we weigh it in the balances of what the morality of our nation says is okay, or what we want to do? You heard this morning in this testimony that Jean Ann was raised in a very, very strict environment, and the harder you hold on to somebody, the more you, that makes them want to go something and do something else. So mentoring people cannot be a dictatorship or an anarchy. We're called to love one another, but to speak the love and truth. How we speak into somebody's life is critical in terms of whether they receive it or not. But if we are spoken to and the truth comes to us, do we delude that and say, well, everybody else is doing this and our, our convictions and our culture and the morality in our nation is shifting? Does that make it right? What is our standard? Is the standard for godly living and consecration what the world does or is it what the Word says? And I think that we have to embrace that. Some of you have been believing a lie for so long that two things will happen today. Some are already thinking in their mind, there's things I need to change, there's things I need to shift, and today you're in your mind making an inventory of how that's going to happen. For some of you, it will be a process. Because we've isolated ourselves in this culture to the degree that we have 6,000 friends on Facebook and none of them are willing to tell us the truth. And when somebody tells us the truth, we almost need a paramedic there with oxygen. Because the truth is becoming a rarity. The scarcity of the truth is creating a greater desire in my life, and I think yours, for the power of God. Lord, we need you more than ever today. The Bible says in one of the Old Testament prophets that in the last days, there will be a famine of the Word of God, of hearing the Word of God. And of all the things that we hear, is it possible that we are deceiving ourselves? And when we wear a mask, we can't always see clearly, and we do not always have the clarity that we need. One of the other definitions of of deceive is imposing a false idea resulting in helplessness. The enemy wants to bring you into a position where you no longer are moved by the authority of the Word of God, that you measure it with other things that are happening in the world and you find your own truth. When you do that, you are left helpless. When you are left helpless, you become a victim to the enemy and what he desires to do. You become very vulnerable. But the Old Testament scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. Let the truth be the measuring tool of your life. Let truth of the word of God be the gauge. Open your life to someone that you trust and tell them, I need you to be honest with me. But if you don't want them to be honest, don't ask them. Because all of us have people in our life that love us, and those are the people that we should bring close to us and say, listen, is there anything that you see in my life that could hinder me from walking in the power of God? Because in that moment, we make a decision whether the kingdom is our priority or we just want what we want. 
And we live in a world today where people are self-indulgent. They want what they want when they want it. And I'm as guilty as anyone. I went to McDonald's the other morning to get my senior coffee. So glad to be 67. Because it only cost me 50 cents while you young bucks are paying 250 and four bucks for something that doesn't even taste good. And I'm waiting a little longer and all of a sudden my impatience kicked in. And I'm wondering, what in the world? Did they not hire enough people? Some of these, probably some of these young people that are working up there and don't know what an Egg McMuffin is. All I want is a senior coffee. Is, how hard is that? But I have pulled up, and they have told me, sir, could you wait for a minute because we're brewing a new batch? And I waited 15 minutes. Finally, I went in, and they forgot about the old guy. So it's very easy to become impatient and to hide it. But I have the great opportunity of being vulnerable. What is your platform? Who do you have in your life that will help you with things in your life that you need help with? Some have been wearing religious masks. And we do it because there's an element in our life that's so much like God that we want God, but we're not sure how to get there. And when people tell us, this is how you get God, and we go, I don't know if I can do that. How do I do that? That's why discipleship and mentoring and life groups are so critical and so important. And I'm wondering, we can blame whoever we want for the shutdown of churches and everything that's happening and health departments overreaching, and we can blame all of that. But like a classmate of mine told me on the phone, could we just look for the good? Could we discover what God is trying to do in shifting our lives to make a greater influence and impact? Every one of you within the sound of my voice, God has done Done something supernatural and miraculous in your life. I'm pleading with you today, do not keep it hid. When people are deceived, there will come a time before the coming of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11 and 12, that the Lord will allow a delusion to come and people will be a, leave a lie and be damned. How many of you watch people believing lies today and they're walking in so much fear? Not wisdom, fear. And fear is restricting them and fear is holding them back and fear is just overwhelming them. Let me just make this statement. Those who don't know don't know what they don't know. This is an incredible revelation. It took me a long time to think about this. Those who don't know don't know what they don't know. They don't know. And the only thing that's going to liberate them is the truth of the Word of God. I believe I'm in the right place, and I believe I'm with a group of people here and that are watching that believe unequivocally that the Word of God is settled in heaven, and it is the truth, and it is a manual for life that will help us succeed and see every need in our life met. There are two truths that I want to examine just for a moment of those that are self-deceived. Let me remind you of the scripture in James. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, lest you deceive yourself. In other words, unless you end up in a place where you are helpless. Unless you find yourself in a place weighing truth against our culture and diluting the power and the effectiveness of the Word of God. You're, if you ask my wife, she bought me a Bible when I first started dating her. I don't know that we were dating. I think I was trying to trap her, and that's the truth. And she was trying to avoid it as much as possible, and that was the truth. But I remember buying me a Bible, and there was a particular scripture that was preached in the church often, and I wore my Bible out at that scripture. And she will validate that I continued to weigh the lifestyle of my family against that scripture and say, what about that? She was very wise. She never answered. She knew what the truth was, but she knew that if I spoke too quickly, if she spoke too quickly, that it would set me on edge. 
And so when truth faces us, even if we know that it has the capacity to free us, it first makes us miserable. Because truth forces us to seek God. Now remember, when I started dating her, I was raised with a specific value system, morally, and I was raised with a certain value system spiritually that quite honestly did not measure up to the Word of God. Are you with me? So I found myself vulnerable to many, many things. So what I didn't know, I didn't know that I didn't know. So I needed to be approached and confronted with what the truth was. Because I can never make the changes in my life if I don't know how to do it and I don't know what truth is. If you come to me and tell me I'm going on a vacation, could you draw me a map? I might look at you rather bewildered if you don't tell me where you're going. And people are living life like that. They want to go somewhere, but they don't know for sure where they're going, but they want to be free and liberated as they go. But if you don't know where you're headed, how do you know when you've arrived? So let's examine a couple of things that I believe are critical if we want to remove the mask of self-deception. Now, if it's not you, maybe you know somebody. I have a good friend. I, I saw them the other day attended church here for years. They were baptized in water. God did a miracle in their life, baptized them in the Holy Spirit, and now they're involved in a cult. And they're very adamant because somebody met a need in their life and ran interference and took a lie instead of the truth. So we have to know what the Word says so that we Don't find ourselves walking that way. Here's what I want to give you, number one. The longer we view ourselves through a distorted lens, the more likely we are to believe a distorted truth. How many of you have 20-20 vision? You don't have to wear glasses. You don't have reading glasses. You're not arriving at that age yet. Nobody has 20-20 vision. Well, Lord, I just pray for people's eyesight this morning, or I pray for them to be honest. Maybe you didn't hear the question. How many of you have, let me see, you have great vision without any artificial, okay? If I was to bring you up here and put my glasses on, you would have a problem. You would not be able to see clearly. Things would be a distorted. And when we see things through a distorted view, we begin to believe a distorted truth. When we don't see things clearly and we gauge our life by the values of our culture, that's distorted. Then we begin to believe that distorted value system, which leaves us deceived and helpless. There's two kinds of deception. There's the kind of deception that Satan brought to Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and questioned the authority of the Word of God. The enemy wants to deceive you, set a trap for you, snare you, take you captive. But then there's the kind of deception that so many people fall into. It's self-deception because we do not want to make the decisions that bring change in our life and freedom. And we may even know that it's the right thing to do. So when we begin to look through a distorted lens, have you ever looked through a magnifying glass? Job said, I've looked at God and I see the edges of his ways. When you look through a magnifying glass, you can see the articulate weave of material very clearly within a particular arena, but the edges are very blurred. And sometimes in life, that happens. And how we perceive God, do we perceive God within the light of every religion, no matter what you believe, all roads lead to heaven? I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and if you're not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, heaven is not your home. It's the power of the blood that redeems you. 
Yeah, but pastor, you're being, you're being hard and hostile and we're supposed to be merciful and gracious. You are weighing the legitimacy of the truth in light of our cultural influence. Because in our culture, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We need to be politically correct. Doesn't matter what you believe, everybody's a good person and God loves everybody. That's very shallow and it reveals the lack of experience in relationship with Him. It reveals the distorted lens through which we are looking. So then we begin to believe a distorted truth. So then we say, it doesn't matter what you do, who you embrace, who you engage in physical relationships, God loves everybody. So what we're saying is there's no absolute truth. But I dare to differ with you because there is a truth that is settled in heaven that will set people free. Our culture and our world is in an enormous mess because we've been looking through a distorted lens and now we're believing a distorted truth. And anyone who dares stand up and brandish a sword against that is labeled radical or a hater. We don't hate anybody. We love everybody. But we do know that your sin will deter you and that if the enemy can't deceive you, he'll try to get you to see things in a distorted way where you deceive yourself. I am in Psalms 36, verse 2 and 3, and the Bible says this, In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or to do good. It is amazing to me, you can read in the book of Acts, where Paul goes to Ephesus and the town's clerk begin to raise his voice against Paul. Whenever you see politicians jumping on board to make religious decisions, there's money involved. There's greed behind it. I remember years ago in Faith Chapel, one of the local men that were running for judge, he already held that office, he showed up in church on a Sunday morning, and in my naivety, I thought he was there to check us out. Maybe he's going to start coming. No, he didn't want to start coming. He wanted my vote. Hello? Can I read that scripture again? I'm reading from the Word of God, by the way. I'm reading from the Word that God established that will liberate you and free you in their blind conceit. They cannot see how wicked they really are, then what do we do? We stand for the truth and we live the truth in our life. We live out the liberty and the freedom of the truth of God. Our testimony today said there were certain restrictions placed upon her that were viewed by the church as necessary to go to heaven. All of those rules are unnecessary if you have a relationship with Jesus. The things the church tried to get them to do, if they really would allow people to have a relationship with Jesus and continue to create an atmosphere of the Spirit and of the Word, they would do what was trying to be forced upon them. Hallelujah. And so, what do I do when I don't know what to do? Have you ever had children or friends say, I'm going to go do this, and your eyes got real big? And, and, and people looked at you like, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Other people do that. Well, if you're going to jump off a cliff or if somebody else is doing it, are you going to do it? I need an usher to help me here because there's a little 100-pound girl outweighing two mamas. It just is what it is. It's our daily Sunday morning wrestling match. So we're getting our cardio workout. You want to be taken to the blue room? (laughs) Sorry. All right, we'll wait till you make your exit. Wave to everybody. Wave, say goodbye. See that? Some people act up because they just want attention. Hello? You haven't had a child like that? that will just act up because they want your attention? 
Can I give you a recommendation? Give them the attention first so that they have what they need. And so we, we do things and, and we see people making decisions and I see it happening in the kingdom of God and I don't have the time to explore all the avenues, but I'm watching people take a look of distortion and embrace distorted values and then it becomes their distorted truth. And it's happening in our churches. One church took the word blood out of all of their songs. How do we remove the blood? It's the blood that saves us. It's the blood that heals us. It's the blood that redeems us. It's the blood that helps us, that straightens out our life, that calms our fears and gives us the strength to move through every mountain, every valley. Number two, people that are self-deceived. Often the more convinced you are that you're right, the more likely you are wrong. See, there has to be a flexibility to say, I was raised this way, but I'm willing to lay all of this on the altar. And there was a time in my life where I had to say, God, I'm going to lay this right in front of you. You choose what's good for me because I'm at a point where I don't know what to believe anymore because there's so many voices out there. And I go back to your word, and there's so many voices that want to interpret the word of God in particular ways. I'm not talking about superficial things that don't have necessarily eternal relevance, but I'm talking about basic things. No longer do you have to repent of your sins. Just honk out in the parking lot. We'll get you a membership certificate. When did that happen? When did we take the altar out of our churches? When did we stop telling people they had to repent of their sin? Well, that's too harsh because everybody has sin and we just need to love God. But when do you repent of your sin? Because Jesus said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. And so deception is coming along to water down everything that we have believed. I want you to take a look at Peter's life in Matthew 26, because if you follow me very much, we've examined the life of Peter. Peter is up and down. He's one of the 12 disciples that are called, but we're not quite sure that that moment that he was called, he embraced, because in Luke chapter 5, Jesus gets in his boat, a miracle happens, Peter falls on his face and says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. But now, on the way to the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has warned Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's wearing his mask. No, not me. I know that you called me shaky, shaky. I know that you prayed for me that my faith would not fail. And I know that I'm up and down like a yo-yo, but this time I'm going to make good on it. Well, Peter, that's wonderful. You've been following Jesus, but when are you going to allow him to absolutely and totally direct your life and have a relationship with him? Peter, I know you've been going to church and you've been following me around and miracles have happened, but when are you going to have an experience with me that transforms your life? So Peter says, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. But Peter, your history says something else. You're as shaky as a glass of water in a hailstorm. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. Here's what Peter says. Now, a humble heart would have said, really? Lord, what can I do to change that? What needs to happen in my life so that I wouldn't do that? So Peter is saying, no, you're wrong, Jesus. You don't know what you're talking about. Hello? No, don't look at me like you've never said that to him when he's asked you to do something and you said, Lord, that can't be you. That must be some other spirit. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. We know that Peter at that point was not willing to die. He scurried away like a squirrel up a tree when the adversity came, and he didn't have the relationship that he needed, but it was coming. And Peter was looking through a distorted lens so that he was walking in a distorted truth. I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. All the rest of them just needed somebody to speak up and somebody to follow. We'll never forsake you. Let me give you three keys quickly that will help you remove the mask of self-deception. Number one, you must be willing to pray. Psalms 139 verse 
23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. When's the last time you prayed that? Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Search me. Search me. I open the corridors of my life, examine every room of my heart, even the one that I have blocked and crossed off and yellow police tape on that says to you, Jesus, no entry. I'm hiding that from you. And he says, I already know what's behind the door. Search me and know my heart because there's one thing for sure. We don't even know our own heart. We don't always know how we will react in a given situation. Sometimes we respond gracefully, and sometimes it's like a stick of dynamite has gone up. Yep. Know my anxious thoughts. Verse 24, point out anything in me that offends you. God, is there anything in my life that offends you? Search me. Lead me along the path of everlasting life. That is a prayer that I think is critical if we are going to drop the mask of self-deception. We were having a Bible study in my parents' home. We were up on a Thursday night, and uh, we had a couple that was coming. I've shared some of these things. I've shared this story before, but I'm getting old, and I have a right to share it again. And they were a thorn bush in my life. Have you ever had anybody that was a thorn in your life? Anybody ever have a thorn bush in your life? Okay? Maybe God's wanting to change something in you. They eventually left the church, and I felt rejection and felt bad. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, you know what? Stop feeling rejected because here's the deal. Is it possible that maybe I remove them from your life because they are not helpful to where I want to take you? And we're stewing in rejection. And God's saying, I'm just trying to separate them out of your life because they're a load you don't need. So anyway, I, on the way home, we had an hour drive, and in our 19... Uh, 79 canary yellow Chevette, the Lord dropped a scripture in my heart from Psalms 119 and verse 165. I went, this is what I need. Come on now, listen to me. I've got my mask of self-deception on. I don't think this scripture has anything to do with me. I'm going to take this quiver out of, this arrow out of my quiver, and I'm going to shoot it at them, and they're going to see that I'm right. And that scripture says this, great peace have they which love thy law and are offended at nothing. That's good. Well, it wasn't at the time. <laughs> I didn't like it at the time. But then I discovered I'm not always right. Please don't tell my wife that. She's sitting here. Please block her ears, Lord, because she thinks I'm right all the time. God bless her heart. <laughs> one of the greatest things you can do is to pray those things, but one of the avenues of prayer is worship because worship changes your perspective. Worship attracts the presence of God. It's in worship that God can speak to you. Worship is really a form of prayer. Why would you approach somebody and give them honor and glory and reverence if you didn't believe they had the ability to help you and to strengthen you? Number two, is you have to be willing to listen. We're in a culture today where we've stopped listening. We, we only listen to respond, not to hear. Over in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15 and verse 31, the Bible says if you listen to constructive criticism, constructive criticism is criticism that will help build you, help facilitate you. You will be at home among the wise. Verse 32, if you reject discipline, you only harm yourself, but if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. How many times have we blocked people out of our life because we didn't want to hear what they had to say and we labeled it as destructive criticism while all the while we knew we needed to change, we just didn't want it to come from them. I want criticism to come from who I want it to come from. Sometimes instructive criticism comes from your enemies. Are you mature enough or hungry enough for God, that even your enemy can give you constructive criticism because I believe God could use your enemies to advance you. Yes. Yeah. Psalms 23 says he prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. No enemies, no table. No enemies, no increase. No enemies, 
no victory. Help me, somebody. I'm running out of words. No enemies, no advanced movement. So God can use your enemies to advance you. Refusing constructive criticism, one translation says, shows that you have no interest in improving your life. Number three, change. Change. If you pray and worship and you listen, then you have to make the decision to change. Well, I'm praying that God changes me. Well, you could pray for a long time because change is a result of you making, first of all, a decision to do something different. We want everybody else to change so that we feel comfortable in our dysfunction. (laughs) Hello? Let me take you back to James 1.22 again. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. How do I change? I pray. I listen. I have somebody in my life that is willing to engage with me and help me in constructive evaluation. How about that? That's better than criticism. Now I've got about three other people that are now listening. Constructive evaluation on how I can move forward. When you have a passion for God, you have a desire to do something for God, you want people to speak into your life because I don't want to mess up and fall snare to the enemy's plans when I could have avoided it if I just would have listened to someone. I have a few of my children in this room. I will not ask them to stand up or hold up their hand because we want to help them remain slightly anonymous. But they would validate that there are probably times in their life that I have warned them about certain situations. And if they would have received my constructive information, things might be different. Well, we're the same way as believers. We surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. We want to do our best for him, and yet we hide behind the mask of self-deception, refusing to change because we don't know what it's going to cost us. Let me tell you up front, it will cost you something. It will cost you bondage. It will cost you incarceration. It will cost you the willingness to avoid those things. Because you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. Jesus says in the same portion of Scripture, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He didn't say the truth will set you free. If you are created to be free, then it is improper for you to be incarcerated spiritually to be restricted. God created for you to soar, to be liberated, to be free, to be delivered, to not be hindered by past dysfunctional trauma, to not be restricted by temporary relationships that have no long-term benefits. Change. You say, well, I would change, but excuses are the crutches of the uncommitted. How long will the church make an excuse for why they can't do what God has ordained and empowered us to do because we don't want to make any changes in our life and we're too comfortable? The day of being comfortable, in my opinion, is pretty much over. Hello? Have you noticed? Have you noticed what's happening in our nation? Have you noticed what's coming to a community close to you? Have you noticed that there are God-haters out there? And you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. You have the capacity and the ability and a God that loves you and embraces you that will help you in every situation. And if the church is willing to be honest and say, Lord, forgive me, examine my heart, walk through the quarters of my life, is there anything that is offending you? We sometimes look at the world and we look at the idolatry that's in the world. There are two forms of idolatry, and then we're going to pray. There's a kind of idolatry that takes that which is common and makes it divine. 
a stone, a tree, a rock. I, I was in a drug rehab ministering to some young people. I was invited there, and one young person walked in that was a Satanist by confession, sat down next to me for 10 seconds and asked the leader, can I leave? I'm not comfortable here. Unbelievers ought to feel some kind of conviction when they get around you. There ought to be so much holiness in you, so much of the power of God, so much of the power of the blood on you that when a mosquito bites you, he starts singing, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. So I talked to another individual. I said, they said, we don't understand your God. I said, well, what is it that you worship? I said, well, I'm a naturalist. I said, so you worship the trees and the stars? They said, yeah. I said, so it's interesting. That tree that's out there in the meadow, you would be willing to say that it has some elements of divinity and worthy of worship. Yeah. I said, that's interesting because the tree's out there and you're in here and the tree is not helping you. Until the acid of your pain eats through the wall of your denial, you will never change. But somebody in your life that is close to you, that you love, and you know they love you, if they approach you and say, listen, I'm really concerned. I want to see you do well in the kingdom. And I think you're struggling with something. Don't blow it off. Don't stiff arm them. Begin to open your heart and say, God, Examine me. Walk through the corners of my heart. Is there anything in my life that is offensive to you? The second kind of idolatry is taking that which is divine and making it common. And that kind of idolatry is prevalent in our churches today. Because we give the ball games and the concerts more of our lung power and worship than we do our Savior. And now we're in a scenario in our country where I don't know of anyone that doesn't have some element of frustration in their life about how things are going or not going or the way they should be going. And all of a sudden, it's beginning to reveal those things in our heart that might not be like Him. And if this is what it takes, then so be it. God, it's your church. And you said that you'll have a church that is without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Examine my heart, God. Are you willing to pray that today? Are you willing sometime to take this and think about it and say, God, examine my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me, anything that's not pleasing to you. Is there anything that offends you? How do I represent you, Lord? What are you trying to speak to me? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to position me? How are you trying to posture me? And all of a sudden, the Lord gives you some insight about the potential in your life, and you disqualify yourself and say, I can't do that. Is it possible that God can extract more from you than what you even think you're capable of because he put it within you? There is a world that is lost, that's hurting, that is desperate, that is searching. They're at a point where they're not quite sure what to believe. They're frustrated at everything that's happening and the thought of not being able to send their kids back to school and their job and childcare costs is just turmoil. But God does his best work in chaos. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, It's in chaos that God can come and speak a word and bring clarity. Would you stay with me today? Maybe you're watching from some particular venue. Maybe you're somewhere else. Maybe you just connected with us. Maybe you're in a hotel room. Maybe you're in your home. I challenge you today to pray this prayer. Lord, is there anything in me that is offensive to you? Because I am your ambassador. I'm representing you. And our church has been praying for revival for years. And I have a file of prophecies about the glory of God. Is it possible that what we've been praying, we're now living out and God's just readjusting and reshaping things on the chessboard of his purpose? 
There's some changes that I'm having to make. Can I be honest with you? I don't like it. But God didn't ask me if I liked it or not. He said, are you willing to follow my instructions and are you willing to be obedient? Maybe you're watching today, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not totally sold out. Maybe you're in this auditorium. Maybe you're taking your relationship with Jesus for granted. Maybe you are not flowing in the power of purpose to the degree that God would like for you to. And maybe today you are one of the ones that needs to pray this prayer. Lord, walk through my heart, test me, examine me. See if there's any wicked way there. Is there anything that offends me? Maybe you need to give your life to Jesus today and you're watching because some of you have been watching and you're praying that prayer because you've let us know. Send your prayer request to us all over this building. We're going to pray this prayer today. We're going to believe God for transformation in your life and change in your life. And God can help you navigate this chaos in our culture and bring you life and victory and strength, peace and joy all over this building. Somebody's watching. Somebody's praying today. Would you pray this prayer with us today all over this building? Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I open my heart to you. I ask you, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Live your life through me. I'm ready for this journey. I don't know what it holds, but I will trust you. I will walk with you. Help me today. Cover me with the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this great salvation. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for these great men and women that have gathered in this place under the balcony of your blessing, those that are watching today. And I pray, God, we lift our heart to you in this house. Lord, there's so many that we know that are lost and undone and need your touch. But God, we ask you because we know that your examination begins in the house of God. So we ask you today, Lord, if there's anything within us that has been offensive to you, forgive us today. Help us. Show us how to change. Give us the strength to make that decision because the most powerful thing we have in our life is the ability to choose today to make the changes that are necessary that will bring the miracles that are available. God, we honor you and we thank you. We give you all the praise, the honor, the glory. In Jesus' name.